afternoon. Welcome. My name is Laura Markle Downton. I direct the U.S. Prisons Policy and Program work of the National Religious Campaign Against Torture. We are so pleased to join with our colleagues from the ACLU in co-sponsoring today's event. The National Religious Campaign Against Torture is a membership organization committed to ending U.S.-sponsored torture and ending torture, cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment in U.S. prisons. Since its formation in January of 2006, more than 300 religious organizations have joined our campaign, including Evangelical Christian, Mainline, Catholic, Protestant, Unitarian Universalist, Quaker, Jewish, Muslim, Hindu, Baha'i, Buddhist, and Sikh communities. The United States now holds far more prisoners in solitary confinement than any other democratic nation. An estimated 80,000 incarcerated adults and youth are held in solitary confinement in U.S. prisons, jails, and detention centers on any given day. They are held in isolation for 22 to 24 hours a day in small cells, often with no natural light and no meaningful contact with staff or other prisoners for weeks, years, and even decades. This violates basic religious values of community, restorative justice, compassion, and healing. At today's press conference, in advance of the second congressional hearing on solitary confinement, you will hear from people who have been moved by their faith and moved by their direct experience to work to end this torture. Collectively, we are here to call on the federal government to honor its commitments to constitutional and international standards of human rights by confronting the use of solitary confinement without delay. Speakers will be staying for questions and we will take a few questions after the speakers have concluded their remarks. I want to invite Jim Winkler, president of the National Council of Churches to lead us now in our opening prayer. Thank you. Good afternoon, and on behalf of the National Council of Churches, I want to thank the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and the American Civil Liberties Union for calling us together today, and to Senator Durbin and to other uh, members of the Senate who are, have agreed to hold the hearing this afternoon, we also say our words of thanks and appreciation. Let us pray. Ruler of the night, guarantor of the day, we gather before thee to witness on behalf of sisters and brothers living tortured lives of solitary confinement, mostly without meaningful human contact. We beseech thee to be with them during their sleeping and during their waking, that they may know thy peace and comfort, that they may somehow find thy holiness in the hell holes called solitary confinement. Those of us who are free are privileged people. Many of us can only wonder about solitary confinement, and just as we cannot look too long into the sun, we find it painful to ponder the deep loneliness and sorrow concomitant with the horror of solitary confinement. We have com been commanded by thee to feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and visit the prisoners. Require us not to take these responsibilities lightly. We seek thy strength as we struggle to free the oppressed. Give us new visions of people freed from silence and solitude. Give us strength and courage beyond committees, hearings, and memos, beyond calls and appointments, beyond frazzled expectations. Turn us toward the light as we pray for those who live in the darkness of despair. Today we submit our ways to thee, the one who promises the way and the truth and the life. Grant us courage and grant us strength as we fight for justice. We pray in the name of all that is holy, and together let us say, Amen. Amen. Good morning. 
I want to start by thanking the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and the American Civil Liberties Union for uh, holding this uh, press conference, but also for inviting me in my capacity as Special Rapporteur uh, on Torture for the United Nations to address you all. Uh, solitary confinement remains a pervasive problem throughout much of the world, and in many cases is subjected to widespread abuse in violation of international human rights norms, including the prohibition of torture and uh, ill treatment. Unfortunately, the United States is one of the countries where solitary confinement is most widely used for prolonged periods of time and uh, raising significant concerns regarding compliance of this practice with the United States obligations under the International Covenant for Civil and Political Rights and under the Convention Against Torture. Both treaties have been signed and ratified by the United States. As it has been repeatedly stated by universal and regional human rights mechanisms, uh, solitary confinement can amount to cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment or punishment, and even amount to torture. This is a case where the implementation of a practice fails to respect the inherent dignity of the human person and causes severe mental or physical pain or suffering. Evidence suggests that serious health effects may begin to appear after only several days of isolation, including certain psychotic disorders, anxiety, anger, depression, cognitive disorders, and paranoia. According to official sources, a majority of the roughly 80,000 persons held in solitary confinement in the United States in any given day are held in isolation for prolonged or in indefinite periods. In California alone, an estimated 10,000 persons are being held in solitary confinement, many for prolonged periods. In the, in the report I presented to the United Nations General Assembly in 2011 on the issue of solitary confinement, I defined prolonged solitary confinement as any period of isolation exceeding 15 days. I chose this standard based on research that identifies 15 days as the point at which many of the harmful physical and psychological effects of isolation can become irreversible. Because of this, I find that the use of prolonged solitary confinement should be prohibited at all times as it constitutes cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or even torture. This is not to say, however, that isolation lasting for 15 days or less is always justifiable. All instances of solitary confinement should be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, taking into consideration all relevant circumstances, including the purpose of its application, the conditions, length, and effects of the treatment, and the subjective conditions of each individual. In this sense, special attention needs to be paid to the particular context and justifications for the imposition of solitary confinement. Although the use of short-term solitary confinement with appropriate monitoring may be sometimes legitimate, the practice cannot be justified as a form of judicially imposed sentence or disciplinary regime, or when it is applied solely on the basis of the gravity of the crime of the offense for which the inmate has been convicted. Additionally, when applied as a prison management measure, such as in cases of separation of suspects of association with gangs, it deprives the inmates of their due process rights to challenge the decision, and it may become a punitive measure which can easily be abused by guards and authorities against certain inmates. The same conclusion may be extended to the use of solitary confinement in pretrial or preventive detention, where such practices create a de facto situation of psychological pressure which can influence detainees to make confessions or statements or to plea bargain and raise the risk that acts of torture or treatment will go undetected and unchallenged. Furthermore, in recognition of the special vulnerability, the use of solitary confinement of any duration with regards to juveniles, to persons with mental disabilities, or to pregnant women should be strictly prohibited. Fortunately, there have been some serious efforts to address this issue in recent months that I would like to uh, publicly welcome. Such is the case of the state of New York that has agreed to implement a minimum of five hours of outside cell programming. I have also been informed of other positive developments in other states, including Maine and Mississippi, where actions have been taken to safeguard prisoners, particularly juveniles, from the detrimental impacts of solitary confinement. Other states, such as Colorado, are increasingly aware of the need for reform, and although change is slow to take hold, have publicly expressed intentions to work on reform. 
recognition as of the adverse physical, mental, and emotional impacts of solitary confinement and the development of procedures to safeguard against its application, especially for long and excessive periods of time, is the first step in reducing the and, and, and ideally eliminating eventually this practice. However, solitary confinement still continues to be a pervasive <coughs> issue in the United States and more efforts are needed in order to bring the practice in compliance with international standards. First, the physical conditions and implementation of isolation must be proportional to the severity of the charges against the detainee. Second, solitary confinement must be imposed only as a last resort and for the shortest duration possible. Third, <clears throat> solitary confinement must never be imposed except where there is an affirmative determination that it will not result in severe mental or physical pain or suffering. Fourth, authorities should document all decisions, assessments, and justifications pertaining to solitary confinement and should communicate this to the detained person and his or her counsel. Additionally, persons held in solitary confinement must be provided with a genuine opportunity to challenge the nature and justification of their confinement through a process of administrative and judicial review and be granted free access to competent legal counsel and medical services. I would like to conclude by once again thanking the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and the American Civil Liberties Union and other participating organizations uh, who help organize this important event. I am also looking forward to uh, the uh, congressional hearing that we're going to witness this afternoon. Uh, and I'm hopeful that this gathering and that hearing will also help build upon the momentum speared by activists, civil society organizations, and relatives of persons who are in solitary confinement, and by the persons who are in solitary confinement themselves, to uh, help uh, further public awareness and push for reforms on this important issue. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for this opportunity and for being here. My name is Dolores Canales. I'm a founding member of California Families Against Solitary Confinement, and my son is being held in solitary confinement in Pelican Bay State Prison. He is one of the many of thousands of prisoners that is being held on the indefinite shoe term, which means he did not have to commit an act of violence against another prisoner or guard in the prison. It means that he simply might have just had a drawing, or he might have uh, known a prisoner that might be involved in somebody. It does not have to be a specific act. It's considered a housing purpose, not a disciplinary action. So July 1st, 2011, it literally changed my life. As the prisoners began their first hunger strike, a historical hunger strike of all races joining together for the common cause to raise awareness to the decades-long confinement of isolation. A hunger strike that spread across the state of California, affecting thousands of, pris thousands of prisoners, where thousands upon thousands joined in in support to get the message out that in the state of California, there are thousands of prisoners being held in solitary confinement, and my son is one of those prisoners. My son has now participated in three hunger strikes since 2011. And for this, he has been punished. The efforts of the peaceful protest of the hunger strikers in California have been disciplinary documentation by CDC. But I ask you, what other choice did they have? My son asked me, what other choice did we have? I believe that if it were not for those efforts, the issue of solitary confinement would not even be on the forefront as it is today. As a family member of someone that has, that has a loved one being held in solitary confinement, it is a daily struggle to remain hopeful when we are dealing with a system that denies that solitary confinement even exists. The words of my son stay with me daily. He wrote after his transfer to Pelican Bay, to go outside and enjoy the sun and observe God's great creations. This place is like being underground, straight isolated, Mom. They say summer is over. I say, when did it even begin? My son writes, I always try and remain positive and optimistic. You need to in this crushing environment, although some days are harder than others. I admire the strength of my fellow prisoners that have been subjected to these nefarious conditions since this place opened. 
I also feel for them, no matter how strong they are, I know these conditions take their toll at them on them at times. How could they not? My son has only been held in solitary confinement for 13 years. And the reason that I say only is because I am now surrounded and involved with family members and activists and lawyers and activists that have been fighting this struggle for the past 30 years. So right now in the state of California, we are working on two bills. Amiano has AB 1652 and Senator Yee is introducing SB 970. I ask your support in California and I ask your support in Washington. The support that would affect many family members and give us hope and also the ones being held in these conditions. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you everyone for coming out. <clears throat> My name is Five Mualim Ak. I've done over 40,000 hours in solitary confinement in New York State, um, a little over five years. <clears throat> I would like for everyone to just imagine for a moment. If you can close your eyes and imagine where I lived uh, for many years upon years upon years of my life. Imagine a space the size of your bathroom, but no amenities in there. You're allowed to have t-shirts, underwears, boxers, uh, socks, and a jumpsuit. Imagine when your children come to visit you, they come to the door, but you're not allowed to touch them or see them. You can only hear their voices in some sense. Imagine that every meal is pushed through the small slot like your mail slot in the front of your house. Imagine when you cry out for medical attention like I did when I was pleading for insulin, being diabetic, I have to get my slots through the food slot, my shots through the food slot. Imagine that being denied. Imagine hearing someone in the bathroom next door who has uh, seizures, falling off his bed, falling on the floor. Imagine hearing the footsteps of people walking by but ignoring your cries. Imagine that for 45 minutes to an hour every day, they open the shower curtain and that area is your rec area. Imagine living in that space for years upon years upon years. Now imagine that person being held there, being an average ninth grader, being a child. I was not a child, but I can see the effects that happened to me permanently. Permanent emotional damage, permanent psychological damage. My heart is racing right now as I stand here and speak to you. But these are the conditions that cause permanent damage. But imagine a child going through that permanent damage. Someone who's in the peak of their developmental stages. Someone who's missing their parents' guidance because out in the world, they're not an adult. In the world, they're going to high school. They just got a bus pass. They're thinking about video games and new sneakers. But inside, they're worth thousands of dollars. Inside, they're an adult. Inside, they're treated and punished like an adult. My heart goes out to others because if I spent years in different facilities, I've seen children come in that were my son's age. I myself am a parent. I used to be called father, brother, uncle. But now I'm just known by a number and um, I'm not allowed any human rights. People don't understand what it is to be in solitary. If you don't mind, I want to take a moment to kind of briefly explain this to you. You have to kind of think about how do we use our senses, right? Because sensory deprivation is what solitary confinement is. How do we use our senses to communicate? Our sight, our touch, our hearing, right? These are our God-given rights. And we use this since childhood. This is what we're taught by our parents how to communicate. And then you go to deprivation, which is the side of depriving a person of all those human rights. A person's brain goes under attack, and imagination starts to fill in where facts are in your brain. You start to talk to yourself. But what do you do beyond the time of counting all the cracks in the wall, right? What do you do after you count all the bolts in the floor and how to paint strokes in the wall, right? What do you do after the the wind that comes under the door starts sounding like voices after a while. What do you do when you're revoked by your own scent? 
where you have a beard that's been growing for so long, it just irritates you. But you're never seeing your face because you're not allowed any reflective services. You forget what your children look like because you're not allowed to have the photos of them. You don't have reading material because nobody's sending you anything. And if they do send you the wrong book, you're going to get more time. What are you doing when you're denied medical, mental, physical help? Well, that's what I came out to do, to make a change. I'm a part of the Campaign for Alternatives to Isolated Confinement, as many people who are family members and also victims of solitary confinement torture. Why do I say it's torture? Because for 90 days, I was put on a food torture, which I would like to invite everyone to taste the loaf. The loaf is a punitive damage in New York State, which is a food torture, which drains your system. It's made of rotten cabbage and baked bread. It's about the size of a meal that you'll get twice, three times a day, the size of your cell phone. And that is what you're allowed to eat. But as I come from New York State, New York State has many forms of torture. But we are united and we're fighting, we're making progress. Recently, the New York Civil Liberties Union had a settlement, which affects a small population of people, which will leave a good amount of pressure. It is a first step. It is not as complete as the Halt Solitary Confinement Act, which is now going on, uh, which is actually presented by uh, Assemblyman Aubrey in the, in the Assembly and uh, Senator Perkins in the state. But this will fundamentally change the way that we respond to problematic behavior, because that's what really solitary confinement is, right? We use solitary every day. When your kids act up, you send them in the room on time out, right? But a parent who cares will go into that room a little while later and say, what happened? It is the perfect opportunity to address the issue of a person's misbehavior or disciplinary actions. But when we use this fundamentally as a first response to every problematic behavior, I went to solitary for having too many pencils in my cell, having too many postage stamps. I received a magazine from a friend of mine that was considered uh, someone else's property. But as I stayed there, I received slew and slew and slew of tickets. One day I received the apple in solitary and I wasn't supposed to eat the apple core because in New York State, you know, apple seeds contain arsenic and you're not allowed to eat that. So they gave me a ticket for that. So fearful and the next day I didn't eat the apple. And then they gave me another ticket for refusing to eat. And ticket after ticket, I remained there for five years. Five years away from my family, away from my children. But this is what we do every day, and the change has to come from us. So I come here today momentarily to describe these conditions and hope that you support these changes in New York and support these changes in California. Because if we don't make the change, we're talking about destroying human lives. And this is what we do. Even though we go to other countries and say, this is what you shouldn't do. But let's start looking in our own backyards because we are at a point of a spiritual and human crisis and we need to make change. I thank you for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is uh, Reverend Lennox Yearwood. I am the president of the Hip Hop Caucus, and I want to thank the National Religious Campaign Against Torture and my dear friends from ACLU and, and others. It's an honor to be with you. The Hip Hop Caucus, as you uh, should know, we've been working on the issue of torture um, uh, for quite some time with our friends from Amnesty and others. And I want to thank one of our artists, uh, Yasin Bey, um, more known as Most Deaf. Uh, who recently actually demonstrated uh, what it meant to be force-fed. If you have not seen that video, I would recommend you seeing uh, that video. Um, but I wanted to really approach this time from two angles, uh, my two worlds uh, before becoming president of the Hip Hop Caucus. One, as an Air Force officer, um, that's what I did before becoming the president of the Hip Hop Caucus. and. I was stationed not too far from here um, at Bowling Air Force Base. As a chaplain, my job was to be there at Arlington Cemetery. Um, and so being there and seeing those and doing those funerals, um, you would see the hurt and the anger of the parents um, who would be there seeing their sons and daughters come home uh, in body bags and being laid to rest from war. 
uh, my other world was as a as a young minister um, uh, from Louisiana and burying young people and, and having to do funerals in which I would have to fight mothers and fathers because their children had been slain uh, due to gun violence. So I've been around uh, victims and I've been around folks who have been very angry um, because they have lost. Um, but the one thing that I know uh, from this process is that as a former officer in the Air Force and as a former, as a current and minister from working in the streets, uh, that anger uh, could corrupt and that anger can taint. And if we allow for our country that I stood for and I pledge my allegiance to, to solitary confined 80,000 people, adults and children, it makes me wonder as an officer, what is the what kind of country am I fighting for? It makes me wonder right now as we move forth to end solitary confinement, to know that we can do better. We can do better. But when our children are being confined, what does that say about us as a nation? What is the indictment? not against that child or that adult, but what is that indictment against us as a country? When we have to confine people in solitary confinement in the numbers of 80,000s or more, when we must confine children, what is that saying about us as a nation? So we must and we can do better. So we must end this inhumane practice and we must end it right now. We are pushed forth as a nation by our creed and our honor to do what's right. And if we can't get this right to stop confining children, then what can we do? We can and we must do better. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Galen Carey and I'm the Vice President for the National Association of Evangelicals, an association of 40 evangelical denominations with around 45,000 congregations, many of whom involved in prison ministries and an array of evangelical organizations and networks. I have a copy of our statement which is being submitted to the Senate uh, Committee hearing this afternoon, which you're welcome to have and it's also posted on our website at nae.net. It's a pleasure to join these colleagues in talking with you this afternoon about this issue. Evangelicals believe that the rule of law is a gift from God for the common good. And so when our laws are violated, it's appropriate that there be punishments for those acts. And within that scheme of criminal justice, there is a role for prisons and within the prison administration, there may be a role for solitary confinement in limited circumstances. However, our society suffers from a failure of imagination, and we are dominated by fear in our administration of criminal justice. So we overuse prisons, and there are many other forms of punishment that are often more appropriate. And within our prisons, we overuse solitary confinement, as we have already heard. Evangelicals believe that every human being has a God-given dignity as someone created in the image of God. We also believe that all have sinned, and so we are not surprised when our society has problems with crime. But we believe that all people uh, may be redeemed by the love of God. And in fact, we find that many of those who are serving time in prison have come to be part of what we call the church behind the walls. They are our brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we call this afternoon for a reform of our criminal justice system. We call for sentencing reform uh, so that sentences where prison is justified are appropriate to the crimes, for a refocus on restitution, rehabilitation, and reentry. We call within 
the prison system for reform of our solitary confinement protocols. First of all, there should be more attention to behavior management and treatment for those suffering from mental health issues. And where appropriate and needed, specialized housing for those with developmental disabilities or those at risk of violence uh, so that they could be protected in, without being put into solitary. Further, uh, where the solitary confinement is administered, the time should be shortened, as we have heard. Uh, there should be provisions for human contact. Chaplains should have immediate access, and there should be a mental health assessment within 24 hours of being put in con solitary confinement, where the needs of that individual can be assessed. And there should be notification to legal counsel and to family uh, immediately. We recognize that those who work and serve in our prisons work in difficult circumstances. We thank them for their service. We pray for them, even as we pray for all those who are behind bars, uh, that they may know the redemption and love of God. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Amy Fedig, and I am Senior Staff Counsel at the ACLU's National Prison Project, where I direct our Stop Solitary campaign that works to end the overuse of solitary confinement in our prisons, our jails, our juvenile facilities, and every place of detention around this country. I want to thank our speakers today for sharing their faith, their experience, their beliefs, and their energy to end the problem of solitary confinement in this country. Indeed, it is a problem. We know that our wives and our husbands, our sisters and our brothers, and our children are suffering in the thousands on any given day in this country. That is simply inexcusable. And it needs to change. And the good news it is, is that it is starting to change. In states around this country, from Maine to Colorado to New York to Washington, we are seeing change. But we need more. That means we need your help. We need the help of every citizen in this country to speak out against the overuse of solitary confinement <coughs> and to speak up for the better uses of our criminal justice system, to focus on rehabilitation and the return of our citizens back to our communities to be productive citizens. That's something we all need and we all must work for. So today, I, I want to give you a call to action because we all can play a role in this change. Today, the ACLU is launching a petition, and it is a petition to the United States government, specifically to Secretary of State Kerry. Because you've heard from the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture Juan Men does today, and he has shown a global spotlight on the use of solitary confinement. But he has also asked the United States government to come and take a look at the practice of solitary confinement and the conditions of confinement in our prisons and jails. And I am sad to say that right now the United States is dragging its feet. He has not gotten a straight answer, and this has been years. So the ACLU is asking, what are you trying to hide, U.S. government? It's time to let the U.N. Special Rapporteur come and take a look at what's happening in this country. And so we have a petition and you can sign it. So even, in, even you can sign it even now, actually. I want you to take out your phones. <laughs> and I want you to go to aclu.org backslash solitary. Take a look at that petition, take action, and tell the United States government enough is enough. We need oversight in our prisons and jails, and we need an end to the overuse of solitary confinement. Now, thank you so much. We are going to have a closing prayer today by Rabbi Rachel Gartner. Thank you, Rabbi. My name is Rabbi Rachel Gartner, and I'm representing TRUA, a rabbinic call to human rights, which in turn represents over 1,800 North American rabbis who stand with this community in our struggle. I'm humbled to be here. Dearest God, source of life, source of every single life, in whose image every one of us is crafted, you teach us, Lotov hiot adam levado, it is not good for humans to be alone. 
So we learn from our holy books what we discern from our lives as we live them, that isolation is contrary to the divine intention for human existence. For this reason, our rabbis of the Talmud cry out, give me companionship or give me death. But it is not death you desire, O oh God. Not death of body, not death of mind, not death of spirit, not for any of us. Rather, it is a return to life that you desire, a return to you, a return to one another. And so we repent. We repent that in a free and democratic society, we have let the physically, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, and socially crippling practice of solitary confinement go on for as long as we have. For we know that every single thing we do to one another in this life matters. Every single thing we do or let other do, others do to one another diminishes or adds to our common humanity. So we pray, God, that you instill in us all a hunger for solutions that protect us all in body and mind, that support, support rehabilitation and reintegration and return, instill in us a hunger not satisfied until we have put an end to the practice of solitary confinement. God alone, you can penetrate any wall, break through any barrier, enter every heart. So we pray that you accompany each and every person trapped in solitary confinement today and every day. Fortify their spirits, comfort their hearts, strengthen their minds, keep alive in them hope, and strengthen the spirits and resolve of their friends and families. And may the hearings today give these families not only voice, but real reason for hope. May our nation be disquieted by these hearings. May these hearings arouse in all of us an unease, inflict in us a dis-ease with the practice of solitary confinement in the United States. May these hearings make our nation see that the cost to our common humanity of the practice of solitary confinement is way too high. So, dear God, grant our leaders at this hearing today eyes that can see, ears that can hear, and hearts that can receive, so all they learn may take root in their souls and implant in them the passion, drive, and commitment to end the destructive, inhuman, torturous practice of solitary confinement now. Kain Yehiratzon. So may it be your will. And we say, Amen. At this time, we want to open the floor for questions for any of our panelists. The loaf that you see there today, which I invite everyone to try out, is a disciplinary tool. It is a tool of food torture used. It is, contains, quote unquote, all the vitamins and minerals necessity to keep a person alive. Um, it also has cabbage inside of it, served with cabbage. But this item is also frozen and then given to a person, so the cabbage is then rotten and it drains your system. Um, I don't see any nutritional value in it. It's actually not given to you that big. It's a smaller loaf, about the size of your cell phone. Um, it's quote unquote supposed to contain the nutritional values that keep you alive. That's just not a fact. So um, if you're looking for evidence of nutritional value, it's just not going to exist because a, a human being needs more than that to sustain his life. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, a question for either the, the Yuri Maputor um, or any of the other panelists. If you have looked into I know that, you know, solitary confinement in general, but if you have looked at specifically how it affects undocumented immigrants in detention, in ICE detention centers, I know there's a hunger striker that was hospitalized last night in Phoenix because she wants her son released, and yet he remains in solitary confinement. So I'm wondering if you could address 
how this affects the um, immigrant community in particular. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we, uh, my, my team and I received a complaint and I processed it uh, with uh, a communication to the United States government on the mm -hmm. practice of uh, solitary confinement for some categories of immigration detainees. Specifically, uh, uh, people held for deportation purposes who were classified as LGBTI and supposedly put in solitary confinement for their protection even though they had not asked for it. And I concluded, I published that uh, my views on that case and I concluded that the United States was violating the rights of LGBTI immigration detainees. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, statistical information on how pervasive that is. Uh, as you know, immigration detention in this country happens in so many different places throughout the territory and you know, in, in, in uh, uh, local jails, but, uh, but also in private um, uh, contracted uh, prisons, that's very difficult, I imagine, to determine how many immigration detainees at any given day are in solitary confinement. Uh, but that case I did uh, document and, uh, and, and my views on the fact that it violates uh, international obligations of the United States are uh, are, uh, up, uh, are uh, are in the record of my work as a special rapporteur um, uh, for the United Nations. Um, I don't. I had not heard about this latest case, but I'll be very interested in hearing more about it and see if I can do something about it. Thank you. I would just like to add to the special rapporteur's answer to your question uh, that we have Detention Watch Network's testimony at the back of the room, which focuses on the overuse of solitary confinement in immigration detention in this country. It is a serious problem um, because immigrant detainees are held in local jails and private facilities that are very much geared towards uh, the American correctional style and unfortunately that translates into the overuse of <coughs> solitary confinement as both a management strategy and a punishment strategy. So there are immigrant detainees who are held in solitary confinement uh, for, for weeks and months. I would like to point to the fact that uh, ICE has a new program directive that is supposed to allow for greater oversight and monitoring and limits on the use of isolation and solitary for immigrant detainees. We hope that this program directive is going to be imp implemented and implemented strongly because it would make a difference in the overuse of solitary confinement. But right now, we don't have enough data to make an accurate evaluation. Uh, however, we need to keep pushing. I would also like to point out the fact that, that solitary confinement is used a great da deal in the federal system generally, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons. We know that a great deal of people are now being held in the federal system as a result of immigration violations. Um, they are largely held in private facilities and we know that they are also being held in solitary confinement there. Indeed, in, in many of these private facilities, they are contracted to have at least 10% of their beds be isolation beds. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people being held in solitary confinement and we have to ask for what reason and why. I was add in general, the idea of detaining immigrants is particularly inappropriate and because the vast majority of immigrants have not committed any crimes, they don't represent any risk to society. In a case where they are needed to appear for court hearings, there are much cheaper ways of doing that through uh, community monitoring for a few dollars a day versus over $100 a day that it costs to keep people locked up. Are there other questions? Uh, I just wonder if anyone would like to comment on what you hope will come out of the hearing today and what what the next step should be. I mean, the Congress does have oversight of the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and I wonder what you're hoping will come out of this. This second historic hearing on solitary confinement before the Senate has a real opportunity to make a difference and to make a national difference. Uh, the ACLU and a number of our colleagues in the advocacy community have called on Congress to pass affirmative legislation. 
Now, this legislation should require oversight and accountability for the use of solitary confinement in this country. Right now, the truth is that we don't know enough. There is no national reporting require, required so that individuals held for weeks, years, months, decades in solitary in this confinement in this country, we don't know who they are, we don't know where they are necessarily, we don't know how long they've been there or, or how they're ever going to get out because there is no national reporting required. In fact, most of the time there's not even state level or local level reporting. So the American public needs to know what's happening behind bars. And a great first step is to ensure with Congress that there's more monitoring, there's more oversight, and there's more accountability for these practices. Uh, and second, we need national regulations. We need these practices to be limited, we need them to be humane, and we need them to be national so that individuals living in Colorado won't be treated differently than individuals in Florida or Hawaii or Alaska or Michigan. We need national accountability because solitary confinement is serious. It does real harm and it actually causes deaths. And it's preventable and we can make a difference. So I would say to the Congress, there's a lot you can do here. You can ensure oversight, you can ensure accountability, you can standardize national practice, and by the way, you can also ensure that there is funding available for states that want to make a difference, that want to change their practices, that want to make sure that children and the seriously mentally ill are not held in solitary confinement. We need grants so that states that want to make a difference can. So there's so much that can be done. The field is wide open. Mm. <clears throat> I just wanted to add a comment to two things. Actually, what she said also, uh, yes, the federal facilities do hold an immense amount of people in immigration detention, but also in a state where we have no private prisons, like in New York, it's just Orleans Correctional Facility where people are sent to, which is just solitary. So if you're being deported, you're going to be in solitary also. Um, what, I, what I would love to see, and I'm sure that anyone who has been incarcerated or has been inside of solitary confinement and torturous conditions, is to do what this country already states that it does to follow the decrees that it already has created. Actually, they have a person who is the United Nations Rapporteur on Torture. Allow him inside. Allow him to designate and, 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 and also assess the, the damage. But let's just start doing what we tell other countries that we do. What I would hope from these hearings, what would occur, is that we deal with the conditions of confinement, conditions of confinement that deprive human beings from natural sunlight, from human contact, that many mothers go to their graves never holding their sons' hands, that many mothers cry themselves to sleep as their sons, their brothers, their fathers, they have committed suicide in these solitary cells. I would hope that more is revealed of what goes on, and I would hope for great change. I would hope that before I die, I am able to hold my son's hand. I would hope that before I die, I know that my son could look out a window and see sunlight. I would hope for change, significant change, and as soon as possible. To uh, answer your question from the political uh, spectrum in Congress, um, I think that first thing that needs to be said that this is not a Republican or a Democrat issue. This is a human issue. And so I think that we first need to address that. I think that too many times there's been a political football regarding solitary confinement in which one side wants to say they want to stay, they want to stay tough if they look like they're being weak um, on the criminals. Um, so I think that's the first thing. We're hoping, and I have been uh, uh, very, um, I won't say pleased, but very encouraged um, to see, particularly when it comes to children um, on both sides of the aisle, Republican and Democrat, there is something that there's something that is grabbing. That's saying that why are we incarcerating uh, so many children in solitary confinement? And so there is some hope. I would, and I think that um, not only from the federal, from the the congressional level, but I think also from the executive branch as well. We would hope to see that President Obama, uh, he has a pulpit as well in this matter. That he would also uh, come out and very very and word things very strongly from his aspect. He recently put forth a. Uh, uh, a black male achievement and is looking at the uh, uh, the prison uh, 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 
uh, the school to prison pipeline and looking at those effects, we'd hope that this would be a part of that dialogue as well from President Obama, that he himself would also come out um, from his position to speak loudly against solitary confinement. So not only is it from the Republican or Democrat, but also all branches of government, that they would come out to really see again that it's not Republican or Democrat, but this is truly about humanity. I'd like to add, you know, in the course of American history, the views of the religious community have played a tremendous role in shaping U.S. policy toward prisons and toward confinement. Views of uh, redemption through work or uh, of solitary confinement even. Often these have, these resonate and have uh, roots in, uh, in thinking in our religious communities. But I want to pick up on what Reverend Yearwood said. Our leaders would be wise to hear that there is a growing convergence in the faith community today calling for a real overhaul of the criminal justice system and end to solitary confinement. I mean, after all, you have here the National Council of Churches and the National Association of Evangelicals uh, pushing for this. So I hope they'll hear it. We have time for about two more questions. Um, can anyone speak to the use of solitary confinement against women incarcerated who are uh, making charges of sexual assault? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sad to say that actually this is a problem. Women are not exempt from solitary confinement in this country. In fact, you're going to hear about this more at, at the Senate hearing today. But I'm glad you brought up that question because women are often hidden in the criminal justice system. Uh, and they are also hidden in solitary confinement. Um, the fact is that solitary confinement is used on women that for the same reasons it's used on men. Uh, but they suffer in different ways. And one of those ways is that too often when women come forward and complain about being sexually abused in a custodial setting, the first thing that happens to them is they're placed in solitary confinement. Now they may be told that it's for their own protection, but as you've heard to, here today, it's punishment. It causes real harm and it is something to be very afraid of. And so what ends up happening is that women who are terrified of reporting sexual abuse and being retaliated against don't speak up. And so they either suffer in silence and they're abused further, or the abuser is allowed to go forward and abuse someone else. This is an unconscionable situation. We should never hold the threat of solitary confinement over the heads of victims of abuse in prisons and jails. And I hope today when we hear before the Senate the testimony of Piper Kerman, who's going to address this issue, that Congress and the public will take up action to protect women wherever they are from sexual abuse. Well, like, I would like to add to that. Uh, during my time in solitary, I uh, transferred from one facility to another, one solitary facility. And one story stays in my mind where I'm getting on a bus and there's different people in different small cages because it's a bus full of small cages. And there is a child that looks like younger than my son. There's a woman, and there's also a woman who's pregnant, because women who are pregnant inside are still in solitary confinement, and they are abused. I also have a coworker. Her name is Yvette Gonzalez, who did seven years in solitary confinement. Um, she's transgender, but because of that, they placed her in solitary because they were protecting her from population. Um, she now advocates for those in the LGBTQT community because they are mostly abused inside also. They are facing abuse from people inside incarceration, but also more so from the officer's administration. So the abuse doesn't stop. It's basically, fundamentally, this is how we address problematic behavior in every people, all people, even children going through growing pains, women who are pregnant, people who have problematic behavior deserve to have more treatment and more therapy, and we should care for them like any human being. We have time for one final question. For any of the panelists, can we hear a, a little bit more about what would we like to see to replace solitary when we end it? What's the alternative we hope to see at the federal, state, and local level? Yeah. 
I would say the first thing we need in our prisons, jails, and juvenile detention centers is treatment. Uh, one of the hidden stories of solitary confinement is that too often it is used as punishment and containment for individuals who actually suffer from mental illness. And unfortunately, when they get into solitary confinement, their condition is exacerbated. Uh, and that is why we see the horrendous incidences of self-harm and suicide in nearly every solitary confinement country in, uh, confinement uh, prison in this country. So we need to have something else to do. We should not be using solitary confinement on individuals who are disabled and suffering from mental illness. Um, and at New York State actually has a, a model uh, after passing legislation called the SHU Exclusion Law to at least exclude some of the mentally ill individuals from its isolation units. Not enough, but some. Uh, that's, a, that's a great place to start, uh, to give people treatment, to get them better. Uh, you know, we wouldn't put a can we wouldn't deny a cancer victim treatment, but that's what we do when we place mentally ill people in solitary confinement. So give them treatment and provide incentives for better behavior. When you eliminate all hope from people, you give them nothing to look forward to. You don't rehabilitate them and then you release them to the community worse off than when they got into prison and jail. There are a lot of alternatives. For our children, we do not need to be locking them in cells the size of a bathroom. If we did that in the community, it would be called child abuse. Why is it different in prison, jail, or juvenile detention centers? We need to treat our children as children and to teach them through pro-social skills rather than locking them behind bars and especially in boxes. And when they need treatment, we should give them treatment. And we should also give them education and opportunities. Um, they are our children, and we should treat them accordingly. I promise this is my last time coming up here. <laughs> it's, it, that's a very good question. Um, actually, in New York State, there's a bill written by people who have been previously incarcerated, also written by family members, also written by the largest accumulation of organizations all working together on this one cause senators, assemblymen, activists, lawyers. Um, first of all, we need to fundamentally change the way that we respond to problematic behavior inside of people. Respond the way we respond to drug abuse is with incarceration. The way we respond to being different, that we feel is different, is incarceration. The way we respond to physical disorders, mental disorders with incarceration. So we need to, one, drastically restrict the criteria of people inside that are in solitary. So there's certain people that shouldn't spend even a day inside of solitary confinement. And those who we do, we need to create residential units which actually help in therapy to give them more out of time cell. Because when a person has problematic behavior, we need to respond with more therapy, more treatment. And what is a better time when you have a person isolated from everyone else, right? So we need more out of cell time, more practices, more education, and more human contact, not just deprivation which exasperates a person's condition. Also, there's some people that shouldn't spend one day in solitary. If you have no arms, no legs, you shouldn't be in solitary. If you're a woman who is pregnant, you shouldn't be in solitary. If you're a child, an average ninth grader, which is 16 years old, in New York State, that's an adult. But in New York State, we do have the Holt Solitary Confi uh, Confinement Act, which is a more comprehensive bill, but also addresses mass incarceration itself, right? We have 2.5 million people incarcerated. Why do we have that many people? Why are that many people inside incarceration with mental illness? But let's just take a quick memory trip that in the 80s, Reagan cut community-based funding for mental health facilities. So by 1985, these people were out in the street homeless, right? And then what else do we allow? We allow anti-vangrecy laws, anti-panhandling laws, anti-trespassing laws, anti-loitering laws, right? So we basically made it illegal to be homeless. And then we incarcerated those people. And at that time, the Department of Corrections reported that we had about 250 to 300,000 people incarcerated. But from the 80s up, it was a 500% increase strike to the millions we have today. And of course, these people who are problematic in society, who need, who have persistent mental illness, who have substance abuse problems, they're more problematic in society. Of course, they're going to be even more problematic inside incarceration. But what do we do? We just replicate what we do in society as incarceration, where we remove a person from society, from the community, and place them inside incarceration. And just like Commissioner Fisher, just like Commissioner Horn had said, we only replicate what they do outside, right? So we take people from the community you've been removed from and put them in a further dungeon-like state. And yes, of course, over 80% of these people are people of color. And inside incarceration, the numbers are even higher. 
So whereas 12 to 13% of the national population is people of color, inside incarceration, 50 to 60%. Inside solitary, 60 to 70%. So we have to stop this systemic abuse, but it's gonna force us to fundamentally look at how we treat problematic behavior in people. And let's, <laughs> this is always a rhetorical word for me, but let correctional facilities actually facilitate correction mm -hmm. instead of abuse. Thank you. Again, I just want to thank everyone so much, all the groups that have embraced California Families Against Solitary Confinement, NERCAT, LSPC. I mean, if I even started naming them, I would leave somebody out, so I better not. But um, I just want to say that in the state of California, you do not need to commit a violent crime or even have a victim in the crime to be serving a long-term or a life sentence. In the state of California, 75% of prisoners have a substance abuse problem, and this came from a state health care forum that I got this information information that CDC put on. In the state of California, prisoners have a mental one or mental two access, 50% of those prisoners. So what I would like to ask you today, that in the state of California, where we say California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, is it right to leave a human being, no matter what they are, I know a lot of the talks have been specifying and uh, classifying certain classes of prisoner but today I would like to just classify the human being all human beings that are being held in solitary confinement no matter who they are or what they are or what they represent all human beings that are being deprived natural uh, sunlight human contact all human beings that are being deprived rehabilitation so I would ask for outside oversight. Right now in Pelican Bay State Prison in the state of California, it's internal oversight. Literally their appeals process, they oversee one another. So there's no outside oversight. I would ask for that. I would ask for great policy change to the visiting process, to the, to the outside communication process. I would ask for policy change into the way that they use these, um, these housing uh, designated areas of segregation, administrative segregation, because every prison in the state of California has isolated cells that are referred to administrative segregation housing units that are just in the same format as Pelican Bay. So I would definitely ask for outside oversight, and I thank you all for being here, and I totally agree with the gentleman that said this is not a Democratic issue, this is not a Republican issue, this is an issue of humanity. My pastor went to go see my son, and he said, it is the character that God has instilled in each and every one of us to reach out to another human being. But in the state of California, for you to even acknowledge another human being's presence could be considered gang activity. It's something as simple as that. And what we're fighting for, what we know to believe, I stand here in truth. And that's what gives me the passion, the strength, and the energy to keep going. Isaiah 40, verse 31. Yeah. The strength of the eagles. <laughs> so I just want to thank you all so much. And I do believe in great change. I do believe that I will be hugging my son. And I thank you so, so much. Because it's together that we're going to make a difference. So with that mighty word, we will conclude our, conclude our press conference. Uh, each of our speakers is available for individual interview and further comments. We would encourage you to connect with them. Thank you so much.